Trust this morning you are anticipating that mansion God has for you. Somebody says, or a song says, I think somewhere, well, I'm satisfied the little cabin below. Well, if that's all you're going to get, you better be. But I, I believe God's in the mansion building business. Amen. <laughs> and so I'd rather have a mansion than a log cabin myself. <laughs> Just to be honest with you. <clears throat> but anyway, thank you, Marilyn. That was tremendous, tremendous. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of 1 Kings, if you will. I know I'm going to be reading a very familiar account, a very familiar passage of Scripture. At least I think so, from looking this crowd over. But I hope and pray that the message will be somewhat of a, a blessing and a, an encouragement in this day in which we're living, in this crisis, this virus, whatever uh, we're going through uh, therein. Uh, I tell you, folks, if ever there was a, need, a time that we really need to be looking to Jesus, that time is now. Amen. If we ever needed to be trusting God, that time is now. <clears throat> There's a lot of uh, things being sent around the internet and other places. All of them talking about the relationship of what's going on now in relationship to the second coming of Jesus. Now, I don't know all about all of that, but I do know that many of these signs are pointing to the fact he's coming very soon. Not only are they pointing to the time he's coming very soon, the, these signs and what's happening to America could very well be. I do not know. God knows. But this coronavirus could be another hand of the judgment of God upon us. I just don't know how long we in America can think that we're going to get away with what we're doing and that God is not going to step in and bring the judgment upon us. I hope it's not that. I'll be honest. But something has got to bring America back to God. Can I have an amen on that? Amen. Something has got to. So far, seemingly nothing has. 9-11-201, about six weeks, and we were right back where we were, if not worse. And every time something comes along that is a little out of place, we get all stirred up for just a little bit. But it passes, and we go right back like we were. And that's the way it was with Israel. I'm not going to go into all that this morning, but that's the way it was with Israel. They would rebel and sin against God, and that's, what, that's where we're at in this passage of Scripture. Israel had sinned against God. They had rebelled against God. They had a, a wicked king by the name of Ahab, but not only was it a wicked king, he, they had a, a wicked queen that was the most wicked woman that's ever lived on the face of the earth. And God would bring judgment upon Israel, and they would repent and come back to God for a season, and then all of a sudden they'd revert back to their old ways. Their old, their old rebellion, their old sin... And God would have to drop the hammer of judgment on them again and again and again. Well, that didn't cost you anything. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17. 1 Kings 18, 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, look what he said. 
Art thou he that troubleth Israel? Let me tell you something this morning. It is the world out here that thinks the true Bible-believing, Bible-preaching preachers, they think they're the ones troubling America. That's why they're trying to shut us down. Amen. That's why they're trying to pass all these crazy lieutenant uh, laws, loosely laws, crazy laws. To shut us up because they think we're a trouble to America. I'll tell you something this morning. Well, let's look what, what uh, uh, Elijah answered him. Verse 18. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast fo uh, followed Balaam. Now therefore, Send and gather to me all Israel unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, 850, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long uh, halt ye as between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. I believe we need to come to that place in our life to make a, a final decision. If God is God, then we ought to obey him and follow him and serve him. But if he's not, then just throw it in and follow Baal. And the people answered him not a word. Sound like a Baptist there to me. Amen. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet. Well, he, 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 he found out that wasn't so. Of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men, plus the other 400 he got there. Let them therefore give us two bullocks. And let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it upon wood and put it on no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under it. And call ye on the name of your gods, little g, and I will call on the name of the Lord, L, capital L, and the God, capital G, that answers by fire, and answer, that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. They said, That's a good idea. You know the story. I don't think I have to go into detail here. Uh, this, this is an account between the contest. We often say between a uh, Elijah and Ahab. Let me remind something to you this morning in this passage of Scripture. This was not a contest between the prophets or, or between Ahab and, and Elijah, this was a contest between the prophets of Ahab's God and Elijah's God. Who is the true God? It was a contest between who God was and who they believed God was. And the outcome of this contest was going to determine whose God was real and whose God was false. So this morning I want to preach for a kind of, kind of an odd uh, topic, but you'll, you'll get it if you follow the sermon. I want to preach to you on the subject, how small is your God? How small is your God? Now we all know the background and you could go back a couple of chapters and read it and catch up but the background is simply this. Ahab the king of Israel and Jezebel that wicked woman that he'd married uh, <clears throat> by, actually by Jezebel's influence Ahab had, had, had led the people of Israel to forsake God. And he had, he had erected all through the land. You have to, you have to go into history. to, But he had erected altars 
to Baal, which was the god of Jezebel. And he had led Israel to begin to worship and fall down at these false altars. And so if you go back to chapter 16, you'll find that because of their wickedness and their sin, God sent a prophet by the name of Elijah to Ahab, and he told him, he said, because of your wickedness, because of your sin, it's not going to rain for three years. And consequently, that's what happened. It did not rain for three years. That, that's back in chapter 16, chapter 17. And now you come to chapter 18, and three years later, Elijah returns back to Ahab. He calls him out. He sends a, he sends a servant and says, Go get Ahab and bring him to me. I want to have a conversation with him. And so that transpires that Ahab comes before Elijah. And Elijah... lays the blame at the foot of Ahab. Uh, uh, you can read it if you want. I believe it's in verse uh, 18. Well, he says there uh, what I read. He says, I I've not troubled it. You have tr you've caused the trouble. Your wickedness, your sin, your ungodliness, your, your altars to the false god Baal, that's what's caused the trouble. So Elijah proposed... I guess you'd call it a contest. He said, gather you all of the false prophets of the false god. Bring them together. And we're going to see whose god is God. And of course, we know as we read in the scriptures, he did that. If you go ahead and, go ahead and follow and read that. They called them together. They built an altar. Uh, there and it says that I'll, I'll just give us a quick synopsis. The prophets of Baal, he gave them the first chance, and so they begin. They laid their all their their bullock upon the altar, and they begin to cry and beg and plead and call out unto the gods of Baal, plural, the gods of Baal. But you find. There was no answer. There was no fire. And then Elijah erects his altar. And he lays his bullock upon that altar. And then he does something even more astounding. He says, I want you to take uh, some buckets of water. And I want you to soak my, uh, my sacrifice. And I want you to build a trench around it. And I want the water to fill up the trench. And they did that. They poured the water. The water came around the trench. Elijah calls upon his God. And we know what happened. The Bible says the fire fell and burnt the sacrifice. The wood and even the stones. And even licked up the water in the trench. Now the issue this morning is what I'm getting at is simply this. The issue is not how big was Elijah's God, but how small was their God. You'll get this in a minute. Some of you kind of, you'll get this. Uh -uh. You see, listen to me this morning. They professed to worship a big God. But when the chips were down, he was not big enough to come through as they wanted him to. It's the same issue today, folks, if you'll be honest. Just how small is your God? You see, many people this morning profess, I, you hear them, they profess to believe in a big God, and they profess in saying, I serve, a, as I read in Psalms, a great God, 
But when it comes down to putting into practice what they profess, their God is not quite as big as they claim to believe that he is. Are you with me? We've got, we, you, you, see, you see that on every hand. Uh, when it comes down to putting into practice what you profess, what you say, every one of us would say this morning, Oh, Elijah's God is my God. Elijah's God is the great God. Elijah's God is the big God. But when it comes down to where we live daily and put that into practice, sometimes it's not as big a God as we profess to be. Now don't misunderstand. He is the big God. But what I'm saying in our eyes, when he comes right down to it sometimes, he's not as big as we profess him. We can see this happening in so many areas of our lives, and especially in this crisis that we've just been facing these past few weeks. There's a multiplicity of Christians today that profess, Oh, how big is my God? My God can accomplish anything. My God, uh, he's a, he's a, He can do anything. But when it comes down to putting that into practice, He's not so big. Are you with me? He's not so big. On it there. He's not so big. Just how small is your God? Let me, there are three things here, and I want to quickly stay in time schedule. I want you to notice from these verses. I believe they'll help us as we face issues in our lives. There may be other issues this morning you're facing. I do not know what they are all the time. There may be burdens you're carrying this morning. And I do not know what they are. Sometimes I can read it in your face. But I don't know what it is. It may be this coronavirus has caused you anxiety and fear. It may be a lot of things this morning. Maybe it's sickness. Maybe it's like Sister Sherry and Sister Michelle, her mother, and Sherry's mother, and others facing really the unknown. We're not sure how it's going to go. We're not sure what the outcome's going to be. How big is your God? How big is your God? There are three things I want to ask you this morning from this passage of Scripture. <clears throat> as and I believe there's things in my life and your life that need to be faced, and we need to we need to come to grips with this. How big is our God? But not only that, how small is our God? Question number one I want to ask you this morning is this. Is he too small to answer every prayer? I think you're following me this morning. There's not a one of us would not say this morning we believe that God answers all our prayers. We believe that God will hear us when we pray. Let's look at the scriptures and see. Look at verse 25 and 26 from this passage of scripture, verse uh, chapter 18. Look what it says. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves and dress it first for your many. Nick, what he says, do, uh, do then. And call on the name of your gods, plural, small g. But put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even unto noon. 
saying, Oh, Baal, hear us! Look what the Bible says. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. <laughs> and they leaped upon the altar which was made. Call upon the name of your God. And they call on Baal. But I want you to notice when they call on Baal, the Bible says there was no voice nor any that answered. The, they prayed, but their prayer was to a God that was too small to hear or answer their prayer. You say, what's the application, Brother Fred? The application is this. How often do we, including me, how often do we pray, but we really don't believe God is going to answer our prayer? Let's be honest now. Now, you know, we say we think He's going to answer, but we do not. But let me tell you something quickly this morning. Elijah's God was big enough to hear and answer his prayer. Look at verse 36. Got your Bibles? <clears throat> and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I ha have done all these things at thy word. Now look what he says in verse 37. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. And let me... Let me say something here this morning. Just try to help you. This prayer of Elijah was not for Elijah's glory. This prayer was that it might glorify and exalt God. Are you following me? Folks, when we pray... Whatsoever we pray for, whatsoever we ask and calling unto God, the end result ought to be that we will give God the glory when God answers prayer. It's to give God the glory, not us, but God. And so I believe every prayer ought to have this in it, somewhere or someplace. And that is, if it be thy will, O oh God. Amen. Because I want you, God, to have the honor. I want you to have the glory. And if you pray, asking that the will of God be done, then you must be willing to accept the will of God, whatever it is. That's, some, that's hard to swallow sometimes. But anything less is not going to suffice in a time like this. You see, we say we believe that God hears us, and He does. We say we believe that God can answer the prayer in the way we want, whatever we're desiring. And many times God will, but sometimes God won't. What do you do about that? Oh, I've seen people who do that and God does not answer the prayer immediately or God does not answer it in the way they want it to be answered. You know what happens? Well, God didn't answer my prayer. How big is your God? How big is your God? 
Can you trust him whether he answers right now or not? Can you trust him whether he answers down the road or not? Can you trust him if he decides not to answer? Period. Is your God small enough to answer every prayer? We have a God who is. I'm getting the paw. Amen. We have a God who is. I believe that. In Jeremiah, I believe it's 33, 3. In fact, I have it here on the pulpit. I'll go, I'll pass this with this and go on. The Bible says in Jeremiah 33, 3, it's God speaking, Jeremiah writing it down. This is what God says. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. How many of you this morning believe that? Amen. I believe it. But what if he doesn't when you call? What then? What I'm trying to say is they had, had, they had a God they, they, they had a God they professed was big enough. I believe they were I believe they were sincere. They had a God that they believed was big enough. But hallelujah, praise God this morning we have a God like Elijah who is big enough. Amen. And God will answer your prayer. It may not always be exactly like you want it, but I'm going to say this and I believe it. Every answer is the way God wants it to be. How big is your God this morning? Number two, there's a second question here. Is he small enough to be aware of your need? Look at verse 27. Look at what verse 27 says. <clears throat> and it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, get louder, for he is a God. That's a statement. Elijah said, he's a, he's a God. Little g. Either he's talking or he's pursuing. He's in a journey or pre-deventure. He sleepeth and he must be awakened. You see, they begin to cry out and to plead and pray and ask, and ask their God. Send the fire. We want the fire. Elijah, and it didn't, nothing, no fire. So Elijah began to mock them and make fun of them. And he says, where is he? Perhaps he's on a journey. Maybe he's preoccupied right now. Maybe he's taking a nap. Where is he? In other words, here's what Elijah was saying. Get this. You get a little cute... Uh, uh, a little uh, uh, amusement out of this. He was saying, isn't your God big enough to meet your need? They had a need. They wanted that fire to fall. Isn't your God big enough to meet this need? Doesn't, this, doesn't your God know that you need help? Mocking them. <laughs> Maybe he's asleep. Hey, did you know the Bible says we have a God that never sleeps? That's what it says. He never sleeps nor slumbers. Maybe he's asleep. 
Sometimes we react exactly the same way, folks. I have to be honest. When we, when, when we encounter some need that we think we have or in genuine we have, we begin to panic, and what do we do? We begin to cry out unto God and ask God and, and plead with God. And sometimes, if we don't get them after immediately, we react the same way. We think maybe God's asleep. But more than that, we we wonder is God does God know what does God know what I need? Is God aware? Have you ever been here? I'm, not, I'm trying to be real. This. Have you ever been in a place you... If, does God care that I'm right here? Is God aware that I've got this problem? Does God know? If you be honest, you've been there. I've been there. But let me say something this morning. Elijah's God was awake and well, and he knew what Elijah needed. Amen. The Bible says this morning, I get, I'm at, how big is your God? Why are you asking that preacher? Because the Bible says this morning, our God is able to meet every need we have. Can I have an amen on that? Oh, I believe that, preacher. You do? How big is your God? As long as the sun's shining, as long as everything's going well, as long as there's no problems, He's a big God. Woo! But let a, let a genuine need come along. And sometimes He's not so big as we think He is. To us. He's still God. I'm talking about us this morning. The Bible says, and I quickly say this, that our God is able to meet our material needs, whatever they are. Amen. Jesus said that in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Jesus said, The Lord knoweth you have need of these things. T-H-I-N-G-S. But God, God knows I need to pay my bills. God knows I need clothes on my back. God knows I need a car to drive. God knows I need food during Corona 9, 19 or whatever. Sometimes, what, let's get with it now. Sometimes, He's not so big. Why? Because we do not think he's met those needs like I would want him to meet them. But God will meet your material needs. Secondly, God will meet your physical needs. This is where we're, really the rubber hits the road for some of our people here. I'm speaking to some here right here this morning. Oh, listen this morning. When these sicknesses hit us, when these sorrows come, that's when we find out whether he's a big God or a little God, missionary. Michelle, that's when we find out how big he is or how small he is. 
Am I right or wrong? That's when you, that's when you either draw close. That's when the comfort, the presence of the Holy Spirit falls on you. But there are times, I understand, I know that. I mean, we... <clears throat> so many things we don't understand. And being human, the difficult part is sometimes we just got to put these things in God's hands because God's big enough to take care of them. That's right. Amen? Amen. He's big enough. Not only that, He not only meet our material needs, our physical needs, but quickly God will meet our spiritual needs. Philippians 4, 18, But my God shall supply all your need. Now we always talk about that being, think about that being physical there. Uh, I presume it is. But it could be that Paul's talking about something else. I'll get some research. But whatever it is this morning, whatever it is, whatever it is you sitting right there, right now, how big is your God? Is he big enough to meet it? Well, whether you think so or not, can I say this? The God of Elijah is big enough to meet it. Amen. Amen. And quickly and lastly, the third question I leave with you this morning. Is your God too small to acknowledge that he even cares. Look at verse 29. If you got your Bibles. And it came to pass when uh, midday was past. And they'd been <laughs> crying out, begging, pleading. When midday was past and, uh, and they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. That there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regardeth. That's, it. That's just simply said, they did not care. You see, their God was too small to even care. In fact, He paid no attention to them at all. Again, I ask you the question, if you're honest, have you ever felt that way, that God doesn't care? Sure you have. You say, oh, that's not scriptural. Oh, yes, it is. David felt that way when he was in the dark cave. Saul was pursuing him. He was about to get slain. And he cried out these words, No man care for my soul. He, did, he, he, did, he thought nobody, not even God cared for him. He was in a dark dungeon waiting to, uh, for Saul to find him. No man care. The apostles on that boat going across the Sea of Galilee and the storm came up. What did they do? They ran to Jesus and said, Master, Master, wake up. We're going to die. Don't you care? Remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Even Elijah himself, if you read on in the Scriptures a little bit later on, you find him sitting under a Jupiter tree, whining and feeling sorry for himself and having a pity party and saying, Oh, God, I'm the only one left. He thought God had forsaken him. He thought God had turned his back on him. But let me close this out this morning by saying, 
We profess it. I believe it. I believe every one of you believes it. No matter how dark the circumstance, no matter how difficult it may seem, no matter, no matter how discouraging it may get, the Bible says we have a God who cares. At the moment, you may not. You may not feel like it. Just like some others. But can I say this this morning? Jesus says, I, I give you the words of the Master. Jesus says this, Come unto me. All, all, ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Do I believe that? Yes, I believe that. And why do I panic every time some little something comes along? Because my God is too small. Or is it? Oh, I tell you, so I like the way this thing ended. I don't have to go into all that. Out there. <laughs> Elijah called on his God, the fire fell, consumed the altar, consumed the sacrifice, consumed every, uh, the water in the trench. Oh my. Oh my. So the answer this or the question this morning is how small is your God? Or is this morning your God Elijah's God? I serve the same God this moment that Elijah served 4,000 years ago. Amen. And can I say in closing, yes, he does have the answer to every prayer. Can I say this morning, yes, he is aware of every need I have. Come on, church. Can I say this morning, he knows exactly what I need. Amen. I trust this morning your God is the God of Elijah. It's awfully hard standing up here and looking at a wonderful crowd like we got this morning because I, I ascertain that everyone here would, would say you're born again, you're saved. And I think and trust and from what I know, believe you are. But just by chance, there's one that does not know or one that has some doubts or one that has a burden. Jesus says, bring it to him. Elijah had an altar. We have an altar. I don't know what's wrong with people afraid of, the, afraid of the altar. But sometimes it's because their God is too small. Do you have a need? Do you have a burden? How small is your God? Let's stand together, if we will.